Governor Bishop, Mother Wright, and Pastor Wright, and Sister Angie, Joel Wright, and his wife and family. We honor them. <laughs> right, 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 right. Amen. But uh, I appreciate them very much, but I thank them for the opportunity to be able to stand here tonight. But most of all, I thank my God. Amen. I, I do have something that I feel like the Lord has uh, shared with me here to, to, to share with you. And uh, I, want, I want to do that. Uh, but uh, I want to get, you know, this is not by way of apology, okay? But this is by way of letting you understand a little bit about me. Um, Paul said this. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. And uh, I've been somewhat, in times past, you know, some have said, well, and all that dude does is talk in tongues. <laughs> but there's a reason why. I don't know why you do it. But there's a reason why I do that. And the reason is, while I'm talking in tongues, I'm trying to align myself, align my spirit with him. And I can't always do that with my normal everyday language. So I have to tune everything else out and do my best to tune in to him. And once I find that flow, that vein, then I feel free to, 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 to share or whatever the Lord has for me to do there. And I know some of you may not share that same thought or Maybe you don't have that flow in your life personally. Well, let me say to you, you can have it. It's available to each and every one of us. Amen. And I think that uh, every day that we go without tuning in to, uh, to his presence, tuning in to his will, we're, we're, we're setting ourselves back. Uh, but I believe the presence of the Lord is in this room in a mighty way right now. But I think it would do good for us if we could all tune into his presence. There are some that are already tuned in. There are some that are not. There are some that just kicked back. They're just waiting to see the show. Well, I don't think church is a spectator sport. I think church is everybody on deck, all hands on deck. And I believe there has to be a, 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 a reciprocation there has to be a reciprocation of, of anointing. There has to be. And if there is not that reciprocation of anointing from the pulpit to the, ch to the pews, then you're going to leave kind of uh, like, what was that all about? And a uh, good chance I'll leave frustrated, feeling like I didn't, I didn't do or say what God has put in my heart. And there's nothing worse than, than leaving with a heart full of stuff that God has put in there that you didn't get a chance to share. And you know God wants to touch somebody. So when that, when that flow starts, when that reciprocation starts, amen, that opens the channels for ministry to each and everybody here so that each and every person that came here with a need who's hungry, who's desiring to hear from God, God will make sure you get something from him in that service. So I want to invite you for just a moment or two before we even go any farther. Hallelujah. Let's, let, let's do our best to just tune into the presence of the Lord here. Come on, in the name of Jesus Christ. He <laughs> karamoshiandabahaya. In the name of Jesus, come on, I, I realize sometimes that's, that's work. I, really, I realize that's not what, what, what you want to do. You just want to sit back and just kind of, you know, come on, preach to me, preacher. Do your job. Come on, I, I really want to do my job, and I want to do it effectively. Hallelujah. But there's got to be that, that, that giving and taking on both parts. Come on, in Jesus' name. Shekara mohoriata bahaya. Hila mando riando lo bocosi anda la rata taia. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, just press just another moment or two in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, align us with your purpose, God. Don't let us miss your flow of anointing here tonight, God. In the name of Jesus Christ. God, there are hearing ears, hungry hearts, Lord, that need to hear from you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Can we put our hands together one more time? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. In the past couple of services that we've been in, I guess the bishop and pastor has been out of town and uh, with, uh, I think it was Thursday night, Brother Simpson. Brother Mott, I believe we heard from God Thursday night. What about you? I believe we heard from God. And those of you that were in Arnold this morning, we heard a word from God this morning from Brother Mott. It was a good word. and God was in the place. And Amen. Praise God. And I pray tonight that uh, it will continue. <laughs> but uh, uh, Brother Mott asked me tonight, he said, uh, uh, Sister Trish was playing a lot of the older songs and talking about the soon coming of the Lord. And uh, he said, good God, brother. <laughs> are you, are you going you gonna to be talking about heaven tonight? You going to be preaching about heaven? <laughs> well, I don't know if we're going to preach about heaven or not, but uh, we're going to do our best to do the will of God. And, uh, but I, I love those old songs. I love hearing those old songs. Those old songs never get old to me. Uh, I've got a house full of younger people, daughters and sons, and son, and uh, they play the newer songs. But if you ever want to get their attention, all you got to do is start playing the old stuff. And they want to. They, well, Dad, how how come we don't how come we don't sing those songs like we used to? And well, I, I don't know about all of that, but I love and enjoy every time I get a chance to hear them. And uh, I appreciate Sister Trish and her ministry to the body. And <laughs> Amen. Uh, Brother Jalen, where are you? You're singing my favorite song here this year. And uh, that first song you were singing, that's my song. And uh, I, I fell in love with that song from the moment I heard it, and uh, I still enjoy it today. And uh, Well, enough procrastinating, huh? If you have a Bible, and you'd stand and turn with me, we're going to go ahead and read the Word of the Lord. Praise God. <clears throat> we want to take our reading from First Timothy, I mean, Second Timothy chapter 3. In verse 1, uh, and when you have it, say, I've got it. You didn't get it that fast. <laughs> Amen. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know. Turn to your neighbor and say, know this. Also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. Anybody relate to that? Traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God all around us every day. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, 
the scripture says, it admonishes us of such to do what? Turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and laid, lead captivity, silly women laden with sin, led by, led away with diverse lusts. I'm sorry. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I want to talk to you tonight for just a few minutes. It's going to take a little while for me to get there. Uh, but if you will reciprocate with me. And uh, we will preach together, treat together. As Brother Simpson said the, night, I mean, the other night, reach together. Then we will, you will understand my title. I will concur or, or, or I will be the first to tell you it's not going to be not going to make very much sense from the very beginning. But if I can get to where I need to get to, you will understand better by and by. All right? But my title for tonight, Under Duress, <laughs> Brother Glenn, he wanted a title. and He wanted some scripture verses. So uh, Under Duress, I had to give him a title. And uh, that title is, Don't let the noise stop. Don't let the noise stop. Man, it's quiet. <laughs> don't let. Tell your neighbor, don't let the noise stop. You may be seated in Jesus' name. And I know that is about as far away from a, from a text as you can get. But if we can travel a little bit, if we, we can comb through some of this stuff, we'll get there and you'll understand and hopefully um, it'll be a blessing to you. But first, we want to go ahead and try to lay a little bit of a foundation here from this portion of scripture that we read to you. First of all, there are some things that we need to know in, in, in our relationship and living for God. Anybody believe that? Uh, there are some things that you have to be persuaded about. There are some things that you've got to be convinced over. You can't be back and forth over some things. There are some things that have to be settled. And about, I don't know, it had to be somewhere 10, 12 years ago. Uh, just, just in my spirit, things didn't feel right, Brother Mott. I, I wasn't settled. It, I was looking at what was going on in my life, and I was looking at what was going on in our society, in our world, and I, I couldn't find any real peace. Everything was up in the air, and I, I really didn't know what was going on. And tonight, while Sister Trish was singing that song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. While I was meditating on some of this the other day, that song came to me, helped me to realize that regardless of what's going on in this world today, regardless of what's going on in our society today, this world is not my home. I'm not here for what's happening today. Amen. I'm not, this, this is not where the journey ends. I'm passing through. I must go through this time, but this is not the end. Brother Mott said it earlier. This ain't heaven. And woe unto those that attempt to make this world, this situation, heaven. You're going to be sorely disappointed. And when I, when I read this portion of Scripture, it's sort of a time clock to me. It's just like looking at a clock saying it's 12 o'clock midnight. When you look at the clock, you know what time it is. I believe for a Christian, for the Christian in today's society, when you read this portion of Scripture, this lets you know where we are. This lets you know what time it is. Is there anybody here that knows that time is winding up? This is not the world that you and I were born in. 
This world has shifted dramatically, and it didn't happen just yesterday. It didn't happen a month ago. This thing has been shifting and shifting and shifting, and here we are today. We're, we're seeing some of the fruit of that shift, and some of us were, were, were kind of, you know, kind of skittish over what's happening. We're worried about the well-being of, of maybe our children and investments, perhaps, or whatever, and, and, and we don't know what time it is. But the scripture says this plainly. He says, know this. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. I want to give you just a few definitions here. To know means to allow, to be aware of, or to be sure of. Are you sure you know what time it is. Hallelujah. The next definition I'd like to give to you to pull out of that first uh, verse there is the last. It means the furthest, final, in place, or time. Latter end, the uttermost. The last one I want to pull out here tonight is perilous. Perilous times, the scripture says. In the last days, perilous times shall come. What is this saying? We are right here where the door is starting to close, Brother Barr. And if you are not aware of that, you're going to be caught unaware. But the scripture says to know this, that difficult, dangerous, furious times are coming in the last days. Fierce times are coming in the last days. I don't know about you, and you can think what you want about me. I hope you don't feel too bad, but, you know, I, I enjoy watching a good movie every once in a while. I love, you know, especially after, you know, a long weekend and, you know, maybe Monday night with the family or whatever, and, and there's a good... You know, wholesome movie on. I really like detective movies, you know. And, and I'll, I'll get into that. And, you know, some of these characters, they become some of your favorite characters if you watch them from week to week. You know, you kind of follow them. And I, I realize I'm kind of undressing here in front of you. And you may be thinking, oh, God, preachers in the pulpit talking about TV. Well, when you get rid of your phone... Hallelujah. I don't want to fight with you over it, but, but anyway, some of these characters, they become, you know, just the character. You follow them, you know, and, 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 and there's a couple of shows that I like to watch, detective shows, and, and, and you know, but it just it doesn't stop there, Sister Spriggs, because you kind of follow these characters, and then what it makes me want to do is, what are they really like in real life? Are they as bad and bold in real life as they are on the screen? Are they a nice person or are they just a nasty person in real life? And just like some of you, guess what I've done? I kind of scratched around a little bit, not too deep. And I found that most of the characters, Brother Mott, they're 180 degree different than what they are on the screen. They're acting. I said they're acting. And the thing about it, I, 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 you know, I, I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm, I'm an adult. And we have teenagers, we've got young people that do the same things that I do. As far as entertainment, some shows, just in an attempt to, to find some good entertainment. But you know what I find, Brother Spriggs? Young people are not able necessarily to make the cut between real and fake. Our kids, they have role model models. 
of the world of a character that when you scratch into their real life, let me just say it like this. And, and I, 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 please, they play straight as a character. But in real life, they live an alternate lifestyle. Perilous times. When it comes time to try to make a decision, the image that's placed before them is not a true image. It's a faulty image. And if we're not careful, we can fall prey to that. And we can say that we won't be influenced by certain things, but if we continue, I will have to be honest with you. While this is going, I'm contemplating right now. You pull in the plug. Pull in the plug completely and totally because I realize time is winding up. I realize it, it's getting hard. It, it's really getting hard. And please, I'm not trying to be ugly. It's hard to tell male from female anymore. They may look like a female, but when you get up close, they sound like a man. <laughs> and this is scary to me. I've got grandchildren. Walk in the malls or down the street and they're looking and, and they're looking for an image and, and they see this conundrum. They see this confusion that's played out before them. Well, this is the climate of our day. Nothing is what it really seems, what it really should be. Everything's got a twist. Everything's got a bend. Everything's got a gray area. Oh, I pray to God that somehow God would give the church the ability to see and to see plainly. Because perilous times are here. We don't have to worry about coming. We're living there right now. I remember some eight, ten years ago, I was in a care group. And, and, and I was feeling this stuff. And I went to care group and I kind of unloaded. I probably shouldn't have. But I unloaded in the care group, and when they left, when I left, their eyes was like, oh, my God, what just happened? Because 10 years ago, I told them, I said, in another 10 years, everything is going to shift. Everything's just going to go downhill. And if you're looking for things to get better, if you're looking for everything to just suddenly turn around and be better, I got news for you. The Bible tells us to know this. When you see this happening, know where you are. Is there anybody here that knows where you are tonight? Is there anybody here that knows what time it is? Amen. This is not time to be playing around. This is not time to be, you know, on one side of the fence one day and the other side the next day. We got, we got to be straight. We got to be down the line. We need to be what we need to be. And the last thing that a, a, a young person needs to see is confusion. Especially in the house of God. Especially in the house of God. Amen. It's confusing. Went to that care group that night, and I, I, I really felt bad when I left. But when I talked to them today, you know, we're slow admitting things sometimes. You know, because we really want things to get better. We, we want things to somehow turn around and have a happy ending. Can I say this? There is no happy ending outside of the church of the living God. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> it's just a scary time. And can I be honest with you? I, I, I sit with my grandkids on my knees and I'm like, Lord, how is this, how, how this going to pan out for them? What can I do to somehow 
shape their future? What do I need to put in them so that they can have it when they need it? Lord, I don't want them to be swept away in the current of today's mess and end up lost. I'm not a rich man, and I don't ever think I'm going to be, not in a natural sense. But I believe the Lord has blessed me. I know the Lord has blessed me. So I, I really don't waste time on this side trying to garner treasures to, 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 to put up for, for a day that I probably won't see. And I know that's contradictory to a, a lot of you, but, but I, I'm sorry. I, I got to trust God with today. And I got to trust God with tomorrow. I got to trust him with next week. I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't get wound up trying to lay up treasures that I know in my heart, Brother Mott, that I will never, ever use. I can't. So, so what do we do in this situation here today? What do we do in, 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 in light of the situation that we're in? In all of this mess, the Lord has a church. In all of this darkness, the Lord has a church. But what is this church to do in the interim while he is yet working but has not finished his work yet? if I could say it like that. I believe that the Lord is coming, and I believe the Lord is coming soon. I can't tell you the time. I can't tell you the day. I, I don't know that. But I know in my spirit that this thing is winding up, and it's winding up quick. You know, there are athletes today that, we, that I follow. And Brother Mott, I follow these athletes, and, you know, some of them are, they're real men. <laughs> but when you, it's disappointing. It's, it's very disappointing to see an individual come to a place of such success, or if you want to call it, renown, and then when you scratch beneath the service, service, you see, oh, my God, I didn't know that. And we, 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 we publicize them. We, we lift them up before our children and our grandchildren, and, and we make them role models. And, oh, my God, I, it's, it's just a fearful time. I pray today that all of my, 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 my grandchildren's role models are in the church. I, I, I pray. I, I, I pray. I pray. And if I could use this in a way, I, that role model, I'd rather that role model be the worst, the weakest Christian than to be some cat out there. The weakest if the weakest in the church could be my grandchild's role model, I, I, I'll be happy with that. Just don't let them be wrapped up in all that mess out there in the world. The church is our home. The church is our world. The church is our deal. The church is what we do. And I believe that they should be, we should be our young people's role models not somebody else. Amen. He said perilous times are coming. Fierce times are coming. Ferocious times are coming. It's kind of reminiscent to me, Brother Mott, of the demoniac that you talked about this morning. And there in, where is that, uh, Matthew 8, 28, let me read it to you. And when, we, and when he was come to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes, 
that met him too possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs and exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way. I read that portion of scripture and maybe you, you, you wonder what I'm talking about here. What I'm saying is, folks, the time is so fierce. When you go outside now, you're taking your own life into your own hands. You, you don't know what you're going to face. You don't know who you're going to face. You don't know what you're going to meet when you walk outside of your door. You can't take anything for granted anymore. I remember I used to sleep with my, my bedroom door and, and front door open. You can't do that anymore. I never used to lock my vehicles. You can't do that anymore because times have shifted. Times have changed. We're in a fierce time now. Everybody's on edge because they don't know what they're going to face. They don't know what's around the next corner. And this is what it was like with the demoniac here. What caused this man to make his life among the dead? And we walk among the dead every day. We're wondering, what's wrong with that individual? What's, wrong, what's going on with them? They're dead in trespasses and sins. There is no telling what will happen or what the situation would be in that life. And when we leave our homes and we leave our places of business and we jump into our cars and you don't know what you're going to face. All this stuff going on today, all these riots and people fighting over, you know, whatever, police shooting people, people shooting cops. You know, it's so depressing. I don't know about you, but if this world was going to be my home, if this is what I was looking for, I, I have to tell you, I want out now. I, I want out now. But thank God, this is not my home. I'm passing through. I've got to pass through it. i got to deal with it. I've got to champion it. I've got to be victorious over it, but still... I've got to go through it. And so do you. There was another definition in that word fierce that really stuck out to me. And it says something like this. Let me see if I can find it. Da, 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 da. A chasm, a vacancy, or an impossible gulf. Something, Brother Mott, that you cannot cross over by yourself. We walk the streets of our cities and our communities, and we don't think anything of it, but the chasm between you, this, this world is so vast. Without the grace of God, you walk out in the streets without the presence of God manifested in your life on a daily basis, my friend, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing how someone can leave home without a, a, a revelation or even a relationship with Jesus Christ. If I didn't know Jesus and I didn't know Jesus knew me, I'd be scared to death. I would be scared to walk out of my home. But only because of the grace of God. Only, not because I'm big, bad, but because of the grace of God, I'm able to get up every day and breach the door front of my home and walk out into this world and know and feel like God's going to be with me every day. Does this make sense to anybody here today? I, I know we're a long ways from making noise, but we'll get there. We'll get there. It's a chasm that cannot be crossed by human strength or abilities. We need the direction. We need the guidance. We need the help of the Almighty God every step of the way. Amen. Amen. 
The only protection we have in this world today is the presence of God. The only protection that we have as children of God is being who he called us to be. Brother Middleton, what do you mean? The greater percentage of us in this room tonight, I said us, we live so far beneath our spiritual rights in God. We live so far beneath what God has prepared for each and every one of us. And in the midst of all of what's going on in our world, what I've seen, what I've observed in the last little while is the church has grown to a place to where we've allowed this, 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 this onslaught to back us into a corner where we refuse to be who God called us to be. You know, I, I was preaching along these lines a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there was one lady, I was in Baltimore, I believe it was, on a Sunday morning, and, and, and somehow I got on this a little bit, and uh, I just spit out. I said, quit expecting everybody at your job to like you. We want everybody to like us. But we're from two different worlds. We've got two different agendas. We've got two different focuses. My focus is heaven. Their focus is here. Amen. But when they don't like the way we look, when they don't like the way we act, when, we, when they don't like the way we dress, we, we, we feel like uh, we're being picked on. When in all actuality, they're paying you a huge compliment. Actually, what they're doing is testing your metal to see if it's real. Because they want to know if that's, what, if, if that's real, I want it. But if I can cause them to unravel and be unnerved, then I know it's a counterfeit. Some of us are portraying that we have peace and we really don't have peace. Friend, you can still go back and get peace. You can still go back and get that touch of God on your life so that when you do face the calamities of this world or the things of this world, you can have peace to model before them. But if you're expecting them to like and appreciate you, if you want them to call you up, you know, best, best employee of the month without a little bit of a fight, you think they're just going to let that happen? I, I hate to do this, but my, my wife, she works at the college. And, oh, God, that, that, over there is bad. She come home and she's like, Glenn, I, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. Here. Babe, you're from two different worlds. You've got two different things going on here. They don't know it intellectually, but their spirit knows, and they're going to test. They're going to pick. They're going to try and find out if you're real or not. Can I ask you a question? Are you real? <laughs> Are you real when you, when you face your, 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 your situations in this world? When, when they don't like you or they even come against you or they say bad things about you? I know on the radio they say they, we got thousand songs on the radio that tell you all about how God's going to make it better. <laughs> He's going to make it better for you. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't buy it. It's not just going to get better because I, it'll probably get worse before it gets better. Does this make sense to you or is this just too, too, too much for you here? But, uh, I, you know, and I told my wife, and, I, and I, you, you, this may not be your philosophy. 
I said, babe, if they're not fighting against you, you're in trouble. If they're, if they're not riling up against you, if they're not trying to backbite or they're not trying to, you know, create some kind of scan, scandal about you, then, then something's not right. Something's not right. You got to, oh, God. You, <laughs> you got to come to kind of, you know, you look at them with one eye and you look at them with the other. You know, you kind of, okay, I know what you're doing here, but I'm watching your left hand over here. I'm not telling you to be suspicious of everybody, but I'm talking about the time that we're living in today. And if you just go out there and think everything's hunky-dory, you're going to get knocked out. You're going to be down for the count. You're going to be trying to figure out what's going on. And Jesus said, there's, said this. He says, I am the light of the world. And then he turned it around. And he said, ye are. It's all right for Jesus to talk that kind of smack. It's all right for Jesus to talk about him being the light of the world. But Jesus took it and put it in our laps. You're the light. And then I said, well, Brother Middleton, how are we supposed to protect ourselves? What does light do? Say it again. It shines. I need a simpler word. Light projects. Light projects. When it's dark, and the light comes on, it does what? Projects its essence in that direction. Too many of us walk as victims, and we're not projecting the light of Jesus Christ. But if you want to protect yourself, you want to protect your family, the best defense is to go on what? Offense. I'm not talking about being nasty. I'm not talking about being rude. But when you walk into the room, you got to know who you are. And the thing is, your enemy may figure out who you are before you do. <laughs> because you walk in, the first thing they say is, who does that guy think he is? They know you're not like them. But because they say that, we get all twisted up. They don't like me. But I'm saying to the people of God, we need to quit being victims. I said we. And instead of walking and being cowered into a corner, we need to allow the grace and the light of, the, of Jesus Christ shine in and through our lives. That's the only way we're going to confront What's going on in this world today? Because, friend, it's getting darker and darker and darker and darker. But there's one thing that I am assured of. The darkness cannot, 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 cannot overtake the light. If we project light, the darkness cannot cannot quench the light. It cannot quench the light. It cannot quench what you've got on the inside of you. It can't snuff out that life that's on the inside of you. That is your only protection. But they're going to think, I'm, I think this. <laughs> they already think that. But why not square your shoulders back and walk in there like the scripture says, knowing, knowing what time it is, knowing what you're facing, knowing what you have to deal with. Jesus told us ahead of time, he said, know this, 
in the last days, I'm, I'm, tell, I'm giving you a secret, guys. This is what's going to be happening. Don't allow this stuff to catch you by surprise. Don't let it just creep up on you, sneak up on you to where you are, are perhaps even tempted with it by yourself. But know this, this time is coming. Jesus told us that this day was coming. Jesus told us that this time, this season was coming. But are we prepared for it? How are we dealing with it? I said we, not you. Because again, I told you my... I'm like, whoa, what is, it seems like here in the last, especially in the last year or so, Brother Barr, everything just took a slide to the left. And it's going down fast. You know, and I'm not here to endorse or, or destroy anybody's whatever for the candidacy for the president, but how are you going to waste your vote? I don't know who to vote for. Either one. I don't think it can stop this slide that's happening. Either one, it's going to get darker. I said it's going to get darker. It's not going to get brighter. It's not going to get lighter. It's not going to get better. It's going to get darker. And we can sit and we can suck our thumbs and we can fall back in the corner and, and refuse to be who God called us to be and then be overrun. Or we can take the offensive and be what light is, projects. And with that light, Brother Vernell, light not only projects and protects, but it provides, uh, uh, it provides direction. Anybody looking for direction right now? Anybody need direction this hour? Anybody need direction in this situation? I don't know about you, but I do. Every day. Because you don't know what you're going to face. But with light comes protection. It comes, there, 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 there comes direction. And also, Brother Spriggs, light produces hope for those who are standing in darkness. And if we are not who God called us to be, what hope is there? If we don't allow the grace of God to work in and through our lives to manifest the light that he put within us, then what hope is there? When I was a kid, I was an army brat, and we, we, we traveled all around. I, I don't want to make it sound, we just traveled from place to place, but we, we, we were stationed in a few different places and in my younger years, and one of the rules that my mother and dad established when I was a kid, you know, four or five years old in country somewhere that's not home, we wanted to know, well, Mom, how, how long can we stay out on the playground? And my mother, growing up in the South, she didn't know what to do. She went to my dad because where they were raised, they just played until they got tired. <laughs> till their eyes closed and they just went out. But here we were in Germany, Puerto Rico, or wherever we were. and We're, we're asking my mom, Mom, can we go out and play? And she says, well, yes. She says, well, we asked her. So, well, Mom, what, what time do we have to be back home? She, she really didn't know how to answer that question, so she, she talked to my dad and, and asked him, she says, uh, kids want to stay out a little bit later. 
but they want to know what's an appropriate time for them to come home. Like I said, we were young elementary school kids, and, and my dad told her, says, you can let them play. Let them go out and play. I don't want them to grow up thinking they, they can't, you know, play out in the playgrounds or in the yards or whatever. But I want them home when the street lights come on. <laughs> and one thing we learned about the street lights in the summertime, you had a long time to play. <laughs> You could just run and have a blast, and, and that was cool. But in the fall and in the wintertime, those play days got shorter and shorter and shorter. But that didn't change mom's belief. Mom says, you come home when the street lights come on. She says, don't let the street lights catch you out on the playground. So instead of looking at the sky... We look at the street lights. We look at the street lights, and when they start blinking, whatever we were doing, we, we stopped. Heels and elbows was all you saw. Because we were down the road, we were going home, because we knew we had to be home before the street lights came on. Anybody? I grew up like that. We grew up like that. But as I grew up older, I realized the street lights were set on a timer. And they were set on a timer not like 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. They were set on a timer gauging the sunlight. And as it got darker, when it, you understand what I mean? The darker it got then, I mean, what good is light in the middle of the daytime? I mean, you got the sun beaming down on your head. But at nighttime is the only time you need light. And they were on a set timer. I was thinking about this when I was studying for this lesson. And, and there are some of us that are sitting here today who are struggling and we're, 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 we're trying to figure this thing out, and, you know, and, and we're trying to work with it, and, and, you know, and, and it's getting darker, and we're, we're getting a little apprehensive as to what's happening, and, 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 and the light's about to come on, and, and, and some of us, we're anticipating the light, and we're, we're headed home. But there's a large portion of Antioch that's out there. And we wonder, some of us parents are sitting here today wondering what the problem is. And instead of us being what God called us to be, light, set on a timer, and those that are in our families that are out there wasting their lives, wasting whatever, and you want to know, we're, we're going through all kinds of stuff trying to figure out what, what's, you know what they're waiting for? They're waiting for the light to be turned on in your and in my life that will signal to them, Brother Barr, it's time to come home. There's a large portion of Antioch that are sitting out in the darkness waiting for those lights to come on, Brother Barr. You know, I, there's several of them that we're dealing with, that we were dealing with down in Severn. And, I, I, you know, as long as I went to their doors and knocked on their doors and hand carried them to church, guess what? I get them to come to church. But, you know, I got to a place of realizing, look, you got to make, at somewhere along the line, you got to make this your own decision. So, so I backed off. And all of a sudden, guess what? They stopped coming. But then you hear rumors coming, man, it's getting bad out here. It's, it's really amazing to me because they stay close enough to the church <laughs> so that when the light comes on, <laughs> they, they, they can be home safe. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about? But, but they want to enjoy the life. Out. You understand what I'm talking about? They, they're waiting for some of us to be who and what God called us to be. I, I, I was going through some stuff about this, and I said, I wonder at what temperature Brother Mott would know this. <laughs> what temperature does wood combust? It depends on the wood, depends on the pressure. But dry wood, I think they say it's about 400, 400 and some odd degrees. At 400 and some odd degrees, dry wood will combust and burst into flame. I thought the harder the wood, the longer it would take. That's what I thought. But it really didn't have to do with the hardness of the wood. The temperature, when it reaches that temperature, whatever it's got to do to get to that temperature, once it gets to that temperature, it's going to combust. and It's going to turn into fire. It's going to provide light. But a lot of the wood that we deal with has moisture in it. And the moisture on the inside is what retards the combustion rate. I wonder, Brother Spriggs, what it is that we have inside that retards the combustion rate in our lives. It says at, four, at 212 degrees... That water that's in, liquid, moisture that's in the wood, it begins to turn to steam. But at 400 degrees, it's dry enough now and it combusts. But I want to know if, if, if the world is waiting for the light that is produced in our life, what, it, what is it in our lives that, that hinders or retards that flame? Hallelujah. There, Antioch, I, I, you know, we turned the congregation over to uh, brother and uh, sister uh, Owens. And for years, we had a sign up front that uh, said something along the lines of uh, Vision 300. And uh, that was... A vision God gave me, but Brother Spriggs, we never, never got there. To my knowledge, they still have that, that, that banner there, Vision 300. And you talk about frustrating. Some days I'd walk in, <laughs> I'd see 300. And I turn around, I'd see 25. And we go through these cycles. I believe we, at one point, at a block party, we had something like 430 visitors. One block party. Ooh, yeah. Contacts. Then all of a sudden, dissipated. Had another drive, 300 some odd. Those are, these are high numbers now. And, and, and that was great. And we'd ride the wave of that for a little while, and then it just dive again. And when we turned it over to Brother Tino and Sister um, Eunice, I'm sad to say, it was about, I think on our last service, it was like 70, 75 people there. Brother Tino came to me uh, a week or so ago, a week and a half ago. He said, Brother Middleton, I think it's time for you to come back, preach for us. And I was really trying to stay away. And uh, I told him, I said, well, if you want me to come, I'll come. And I came, went, <laughs> and all of a sudden... I don't know what happened, Brother Barr, 
but something shifted. Something shifted. And all of a sudden, he's running numbers like 85, 97. Bef soon it's going to be it's going to be over 100. I, next week could be 100 very easily. But when I was standing in that service, I was wondering what the, 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 the problem was, what the situation was. And I told them, I said it publicly, I said, if, if I knew this was going to happen, I would have left five years ago. <laughs> I did. I told him I would have left five years ago. And he said, oh, man, you're just kidding. I, no, I'm not. But somehow, somehow, Brother Vernell, he's been able to engage even the weakest. He's been able to mobilize the weakest individual there. And though everything may not be done perfectly, when I was there, there waiting for my wife and I to do everything, now, guess what? Everybody's trying to work. Everybody's reaching out. Everybody's trying to be what they were called to be. Even if they make mistakes, they're still out there reaching, they're clawing. And his numbers are going up, 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 up. Folks, are you mad? Yeah, on my human side, I am. <laughs> but my flesh, that's the way it's supposed to be because all of this time, We've modeled and demonstrated and modeled and demonstrated what we were to be. And all of a sudden, Brother Spriggs, guess what? People are catching hold and backsliders are coming in week after week after week after week. And I'm asking, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? He said, I don't know, man. I don't know. But they're running into the communities, knocking. I don't know why. When we were there, they wouldn't do it. And they wouldn't do it. So guess what? I'm not in this all alone. So I just crossed my, crossed my legs and crossed my arms and said, well, if it gets done, you'll get the message before I move. And that's what happened. And the Lord saw mercy came with me and visited me with mercy and delivered me and delivered those people because my head was harder than theirs and I wasn't moving. I wasn't moving. But somehow, he got them to believe. Somehow, he got the weakest individual to say, I can do this. Somehow, he was able to turn that crank on the inside of the individual and say, you got a place here and God wants to use you. And all of a sudden in the altars, guess what? The altars are full. Altars are full. Because they are becoming what God called them to be. Folks, the Lord has called us to be light. He hadn't called us to be pushed back in the corner somewhere. Some of these folks, they're, they're, they're lost. They don't know how to get home. We were coming from Baltimore the other night, and I had a, a GPS moment. I was headed to Baltimore, and all of a sudden, I just, you know, if I got the little box right there, my brain checks out. At 500 feet, turn right. So 500 feet, I turn. At the next light. Make a left. Man, how cool is that? GPS is the joint. <laughs> you don't have to think about it. You just roll with it, you know. And the beauty about it, there's been a few times, Brother Spriggs, I made a mistake. Instead of making that turn at 500 feet, I made it at three. But there were some reassuring words that kept coming from that box that, I, man, I learned to shout over Man, that woman in the box, she says, recalculating. Recalculating. 
You know, and I realize, you know, some of us, we make a big mistake and we make a big turn way out of the way and we think repentance is this big deal. Sometimes repentance is just recalculating. Re That's God saying to you, your destination, I haven't forgot it. I've got it in mind and I'm going to do everything that I can do to get you to your destination. Folks, they, they want to quit because we made a mistake. I told Brother Tino and his group the other day, I said, man, we made all the mistakes. My wife and I, when it came to this congregation, oh, my God, everything that could, we did it. Made a lot of mistakes. I heard a lot of recalculating in 20 years. <laughs> a lot, Lord, I thought recalculating, recalculating. Lord, you mean you can fix this? Yeah, just trust me. Just listen to me. And then that scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. It doesn't matter what turn you've taken. If you've submitted your life to him, he's always going to recalculate and find the shortest route to get you home. Is anybody? So, so what are we so whatever about? What are we so upset about? Go on and be what God called you to be. Go on and make your mistakes. Brother, Brother Tino was, guys in the altar working and they were, I mean, they were doing their deal. You know, I said, Brother Tino, what's going on? He says, oh man, they're moving. And some of us, we, we just stopped. We stopped moving. You can't calculate or recalculate a non-moving. Some of us have given up. I can never. And we've just stopped. Is this, is this all right? And we've just shut down. Because we don't have the confidence to get up and start again. When you trust God with all your heart and you've put your destination in, know today that he's going to do everything that he can to get you home. There's, you know, Brother Wright acquainted me with this saying. He says, I want to be, be saved, but I want to be used while I'm saved. But if I got to make a choice, if I, gotta, if I have to make a choice, I'm choosing to be saved. And I'm not going to let people I'm not going to let position, I'm not going to allow anything to get in the way to mess up where I'm heading. Some of us have missed out because so-and-so took my spot on the choir. And so-and-so is being used, and I know I'm better than them. And so and so, I don't know why they get to do that, and I'm just sitting here. You better check your destination. Because if you got your destination set and you want to go to heaven, you're going to make whatever adjustments you can make to get there. Whatever you got to do to make it to your final destination, you will do that. Don't let position, don't let people, don't let money, don't let giftings, don't let anointing, don't let anything get in your way of stopping you to make it to heaven. Don't let anything compromise your destination. I've seen so many people twisted up and losing their way. And the, the man in the box is saying, recalculating. 
and they're not paying any attention. The sweetest words you could ever hear is, you know, I've watched God take me around dangerous situations where it looked like it was going to be trouble. And the Lord just said, sidestep. Two steps forward. Back in place. Continue on. And avoided a potential, potentially dangerous situation. And you look back and you wonder, wow, I didn't know that. No, but God did. The Lord spoke to me when he was dealing with me about this, this GPS moment. He said, my people have a, a big problem with trusting me. Trusting whether or not I have their best at heart. Trusting that I will deliver on my promise. Somebody needs to go in and put your destination in. Some of you got, you know, all kind of things short of heaven. Well, if the Lord doesn't bless me like, come on, you guys are quiet now. You're making me feel I'm, I'm, I'm preaching bad, but I feel the anointing here. So I know we're not jumping and shouting, but somebody just moved their toes. <laughs> you know, we, you can't, we can't. We can't allow this kind of stuff to get in the way if we are going to have and be what God called us to be. Because in God, in God's position, God will make a move and he won't consult you not one bit. And if you're not careful, that thing will catch you off guard. And then you really have a problem. Because that position was mine. I was supposed to be. I was the next one in line. Why did they, I can do this. You understand what I'm talking about? All this kind of stuff gets in the way. But the Lord says, if your eye is single, then your body will be full of light. What does that word single mean? It doesn't mean not married. <laughs> it means clear. If your eye is clear, then your body is full of light as that light shines forth through your eyes. You can look in somebody's eyes and you can tell. That's why your eyes are so important. You walk up to someone and they, and they don't want to look you in the eye. They got clouds in their eye. But when you find somebody who's got a right relationship with God, you look them in the, and their eyes are just as clear as could be. But many of us are not like that. I'm almost done. But on the way home, street lights are on. Prodigal son, he's coming home now. I don't know, scripture really doesn't say what got his attention. Maybe it was his circumstances. I, you know, maybe just as simple as that. Hey, man, this, this thing is winding up. I need to turn and go home. You all know the story. He makes his way home. He's headed to the father. The father jumps off, off the porch and runs down and Grabs that boy and you kiss him. Sister Trish. And all of a sudden, there's that meeting at the dust bowl in the road. Father and son huddled up together, kissing, loving on one another. He brings him home. He says, get the fatted calf. Bring my shoes. 
you the ring. I haven't forgotten who you are. You're still my son. I know you went the long way around, but you're still my son. That hasn't destroyed my promises to you and my expectations of you. You're still my son. And then all of a sudden, there's this roar from the Father's house. There's a noise of partying and celebration. and Everybody's having a good time because, you know, loved ones back home and everybody's just having a wonderful time celebrating. And I don't know, I guess the servants, they probably heard it, some of them out in the field and of course, they had their own noise they had to deal with. They had to deal with the noise of labor and working and just, just doing their deal. But they hear this overriding noise coming from the Father's house of celebration. And they begin to take their tools and put them aside and gravitate toward the Father's house. And everybody's conversing. What's this noise about? What's this noise about? And the noise was about... One son. Not a group, but one son, Brother Mott, who found his way back home. There was a noise of parting that erupted in the father's house because of one son that took maybe a wrong turn, but somehow in a roundabout sort of way, he heard that sound recalculating. I know you messed up. You spent all the money I gave you and you're coming back home a shell of what left. But I haven't given up. On you. This celebration starts. And everybody's making Mary over him. As I thought about this scenario, I realized that in our lives there are many, many kinds of noises that we have to deal with. We deal with the noise of the world screaming in our ear. We deal with the noise of um, new birth, labor room, hospital, you hear all of these different kind of noises go on. Again, we have noises of party. But then I said, well, Lord, what, is it? what are you saying? What's, what's this about this noise? He said, in my house, it should never be quiet. In my house, there should always be noise. In my house, there should always be noise of celebration or perhaps a, a brother, a sister coming home. But we nowadays, we don't even hardly celebrate it anymore. Oh, let's see how long they're going to last. Let's just cut the party short. We know they're not going to last too long. You see, in the church, there should always be not just celebration. But there's a noise of praise, adoration towards Him for what He's done, what He's doing in our lives. The church should never, ever, ever be quiet. If it's not a noise of a brother or sister coming home, it should be a noise. Somebody celebrating a new birth. I'm back there in that baptismal tent. There should always be a noise of thanksgiving 
of somebody being delivered. Brother Whaley never gets old listening to your story and what God brought you through. Brother Mott, I learned a little bit about you today. And today that's contributing to the noise in my spirit over what I heard. Because you know what? God did the same thing for me. My contention to you folks is when the noise stops, life ceases to be. We cease to be who God has called us to be. I come here tonight to simply say this. Brother Ben, don't let the noise stop. Don't let the thanksgiving stop. Sister Stephanie, don't let the gratitude stop. I don't care if nobody's moving. Sister Trish, don't let the noise stop. There should be, there's all kinds of noise. We go through cycles, there's noises of travail. When we're trying to bring down principalities and powers, and there's, 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 there's noises of intercession where somebody will give themselves to God until that thing is brought down and destroyed. Antioch, if we don't allow these noises to be among us, then we are going to cease to be who God called us to be. Anybody hear what I'm saying here today? I'm not saying this out of condemnation or not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm trying to make you aware we're in the last days, folks. We're in the last days. And if we don't give ourselves to him like he was. Anybody believe what I'm saying to you tonight? So is there anybody here believe what I'm saying right now? Hallelujah. Can, there's, can somebody just open up your spirit right now? And whatever noise that's in your heart, whatever noise that's in your spirit. Why don't you just lift your hands and lift your voice in the house of God. There should be a noise of prayer. There should be a noise of intercession. There should be a noise of travail that roars up in this building. Young person, don't let anybody tell you you're not, you don't have a place here, that what you're doing is not profitable. Out of a pure heart, my brother, my sister, let that noise of the kingdom rise up and echo in the halls of heaven. Come on, in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't let the noise stop. When noise stops, ministry stops. There's somebody, there's somebody out there in darkness. They're headed this way and they're listening. Is there a noise from the church house? Does anybody know that I'm even missing? He cuts a lot of motion to higher. He cuts a lot of motion to higher. Come on, church. Just a few minutes. I know I've gone for a little bit. Come on. But God wants to do something in this room tonight. Lift up your voice. Don't let the enemy silence your voice. Don't let the enemy silence your ministry. Somebody's headed home. They're looking for, they're listening for a familiar sound. They're not looking for the sound coming from a stadium. They're listening for a familiar sound that comes from the church of the living God. The stadiums can't make this kind of noise. This noise has only one source. And it is in God. Hallelujah. 
Somebody, somebody's got a backslidden child. Somebody's got a backslidden daughter, a son. And they're waiting, they're waiting on you to rise up and be what God called you to be. They're waiting for that familiar sound, for that familiar song, that familiar prayer. In the name of Jesus. He cut up a whole rubber high. He cut a lot of bows at the high. Come on, mother. In the name of Jesus, lift up your voice. Now is not a time. Now is not a time to become mute. Now, now is not a time to be silent. Come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, come on, just a little while longer, come on. I want to be what God's called me to be. I want to be who God's called me to be. I want to be that light that's not pushed in a corner, that's not hidden under a bed. But I want to project truth. I want to project godliness. I want to project holiness into this world. In the name of Jesus. My destination is set. I'm not going to let anything get in my way. I'm not going to let anything deter me from where I'm supposed to go. In the name of Jesus, I'm persuaded. My heart is fixed. I'm going to heaven. If I had a child tonight that was outside the church house, I'd be on my face right now before God. I'm telling you right now, folks, they're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. Oh, my friend. Rise up. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Everything to silence you. He's done everything to shut that ministry down, to shut that noise up. I'm telling you right now, don't let the enemy steal your voice. Don't let the enemy steal your voice. Don't let the enemy stop the noise in the church. Don't let the enemy stop the prayer. Don't let the enemy stop the intercession. Don't let the enemy stop the travail. Don't let the enemy stop the noise. Don't stop the noise. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Sister Day, Sister Day, I looked in your eyes, and in spite of your sickness, you're not compromised, not one. Your eyes are just as clear today as they were the first day I saw you. I know you're going through a lot right now, and I know you're going through a lot with your family and whatnot. But let me tell you this, Sister Day, don't let the enemy steal your voice. Don't let him stop the noise. Don't let him stop your ministry. Brother Middleton, I've been praying a long time. I'm so tired. Oh, can I tell you, Mother, just keep on praying. Breakthrough's not far. Breakthrough's not far. 
The breakthrough is not far. Come on, just give it one more day. Give it one more thrust. Give it one more season of travail. Come on, in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't, don't, don't stop the noise. I wish I, could, I wish I had some kind of way to convey to you what I'm feeling on the inside right now. But there's so many of our loved ones that are just sitting, standing on the fringes of this church. And friend, they are waiting. They're waiting. But there has to be a sound that erupts from the church house. There's got to be a sound that comes from the church of the living God. 